Hello, everyone, and welcome to Evaluate, Riverside Insights' first ever clinical conference. We have a great week of sessions ahead of us and are really appreciative of you taking your time out of your very busy schedule to join us for some fabulous professional learning. My name is Sarah Holman, and I'm the Clinical Product Marketing Director here at Riverside Insights. I'd like to personally thank you for joining us for our inaugural session from paper to digital considerations for test design, development, and use. For this session, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Erica Lafort. Dr. Lafort is, is an applied psychometrician with over 25 years of experience in clinical test development. Her primary research interests focus on the development and validation of tools for the measurement of cognitive abilities and achievement. She is currently a research assistant, assistant professor in medical social sciences at Northwestern University and a consultant to Riverside Insights for the Woodcock Johnson. She has worked on the development of the WJ tests across three editions of the battery, and she co-authored the Woodcock Johnson 4 technical manual. At Northwestern, she serves on the science team for the NIH-funded Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes study. During the presentation, please leave any questions you may have in the Q&A box. Handouts can be found in the handout tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. A recording of today's presentation and certificate of attendance will be sent to all registrants by the end of the week. I will now pass it off to Dr. Laforte to get started. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm really honored to be invited to, uh, to present today. Um, this is a really exciting, exciting event for Riverside, exciting event for the Woodcock-Johnson in general. So um, thank you so much to Riverside for, for inviting me. Um, I'm also just really excited to talk about the work that the team's been doing for the last couple of years. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I have been working with Riverside as a consultant on this project and um, just really, really great work happening. So I'm um, excited to share a little bit about that with you today. Oops, I'm having trouble getting my slide to to go here. Oh, there we go. All right. So I wanted to um, to just start out by sharing this quote that I found, and it um, it has to do with how technology is really just invading or, or pervading all of all aspects of our work. Um, and I think if we take that word work out of the end and just it, you replace it with assessments, um, I think it really speaks to the work that we're doing to try to bring the WJ into the into the 21st century and into the digital world. Um, the person who, who said this quote is a man by the name of Sukant Ratnakar. Um, he works, he founded an organization that works with companies to enact change in organizations. Um, and one of the things that he talks about is this, this idea of change anesthesiology. Um, and that means that, or what, what he, the way he describes that is that people are really averse to change. Um, unless it happens in their comfort zone. And the way to try to get people to, to embrace change is to just expand their comfort zone so that change is part of their comfort zone. Um, and it led me to thinking a lot about how the Woodcock Johnson, you know, it's been around for 40 plus years in, in paper format. And um, a lot of you are probably in your comfort zone, right? So you've been administering the test in paper. Um, and over the additions, the, the administration process in paper really hasn't changed that much. Um, but when you think about you know, moving to a digital platform, it might feel really scary, it might feel really intimidating. Um, I know that I had those feelings of, of fear and intimidation when we started thinking about um, moving to a digital platform. And I can tell you from my own personal experience that the more that I've realized how technology can really help make the assessment process so much easier for the examiner, it takes off so many things off of your plate. Um, it starts, you start to realize that, wow, this is like my new normal. This, this you know, my comfort zone has expanded to now include um, the digital platform and the digital administration. So I'm hopeful that that will happen for others as they begin to, to experience, um, you know, the, the assessment process through the digital platform. Um, so today I'm going to be focusing on the WJ4 Digital Brief Cognitive Battery. Um, and so this is Riverside's first foray into uh, digital assessment with the Woodcock Johnson. Um, this battery, as you can see here, includes just four tests. Um, people who are familiar with the Woodcock Johnson 
uh, cognitive, Woodcock Johnson 4 cognitive, will recognize, recognize these four tests as comprising the GFGC cluster. Um, and you also might notice that we have here a little graphic of a laptop and an iPad. So that's just your little preview that um, the digital platform is a browser-based product and the examiner will be administering the tests on a laptop or on a computer and the examinee will be looking at their stimuli on an iPad and sometimes responding through the iPad. Um, so that's just a little sneak peek of what you're going to see later. Uh, Katie Gensky is going to be um, doing the follow-up presentation today, and she's going to be giving you uh, much more information about the actual brief cognitive battery and how it might be uh, how it might be useful to you in your practice. And she's also going to be giving you, I think, a, a more in-depth demo of the the platform than I'll be showing today. But um, stick around for her presentation if you'd like to see more more about the WJ Digital. Um, even though this battery is only for tests, um, it really does lay the groundwork for future adaptation of WJ content. So the team has spent a lot of time designing a platform that is gonna be really, really flexible to allow for different kinds of items and, and all different kinds of, of test applications. So um, I think, again, these four tests are just the first foray, um, but uh, it's a great start. So thinking about the road to, to where we are today, right? So um, I, have to, I have to rewind about two and a half years back to March of 2020. So I'm sure that's a date that will live in infamy in all of our minds. Um, but when the pandemic hit, Riverside, like pretty much every other company, was scrambling to try to figure out how to serve, you know, how to fulfill the needs of the customers who were suddenly finding themselves in a situation where they were doing business over Zoom, right? So schools were closed and yet educators and psychologists still needed to be able to do their evaluations and to do their assessments. And what I think what the team quickly realized is that um, assessments that were out there that were already native to a digital platform seemed to have a leg up, right? So the paper pencil materials of some traditional assessments were not lending themselves as well to a Zoom environment or to a remote environment. Um, and so kudos to the Riverside team that instead of sort of looking at that as a fatal flaw or as, as a fatal challenge, um, took that and seized on that as an opportunity to, to take a step back and to say, you know, what is the future of the WJ? What, what should the vision be for the future? And I think it became very clear very quickly that the future needed to be digital, right? Remote or not remote, um, the way that this industry is, is going is moving to digital. Um, and so that really was the launching ground and kind of planted the seed for, for this digital transformation. Um, so right about mid-2020, this team was assembled, the internal team at Riverside, um, of which I, I've been a part of. Um, and I think that if I had to classify kind of how we've divided up our work over the last few years, I think it falls into several phases. Um, so we had the planning phase at the very beginning, and this is where we weren't doing any work on the actual platform yet. We were just kind of planning at a very high level, what were the goals and constraints for a digital platform, right? So what, what exactly do we want this thing to be? Um, and then, you know, writing very high level requirements for, for the platform in terms of like what kind of a what kind of a digital platform would it be? Um, and we also had to kind of stop and, and take a step back and think about the internal processes for how we do test development, because in a paper pencil publishing world, we have some very specific processes that we go through um, to get materials developed and to get them printed and, and to get them distributed. But in a digital delivery system, those processes are all very different. So we really had to, to kind of rethink our whole process um, and really kind of repurpose some of the resources and try to figure out you know, how, to, how to get through this development process in a way that we had never done before, um, at least not this team had done. Um, the second phase is what I call the design and build phase. And this is where um, we actually went ahead and started designing the, the user interface. Um, what, you know, what should the buttons look like? What colors should be used? Um, we wrote logic that said, you know, here's how the, here's how the test should work through the, through the platform. Um, here's the kinds of things that the user needs to do to interact with the platform. Um, the software engineering team actually built the platform per those spe specifications. Um, we adapted all of the content for the tests, and then the engineering team ingested that content into the platform so that it could be displayed on screen. And then, of course, we had a ton of QA testing. All throughout these processes, um, there's just constant QA testing going on. Um, and I want to point out, too, that the, these two first phases, um, even though they kind of look here like they were very distinct, 
I think that there was a lot of back and forth between these two phases. So it, it often happened that we would plan something and we thought we knew exactly how we wanted it to work. And then the software team would build it and then we'd see it and we'd be like, oh no, that's not that's not at all what we were thinking. We, we messed up, we need to go back and rethink that. So we had a lot of those uh, kind of experiences where once we saw something on screen and kind of saw how it worked, it didn't really, it didn't really meet the needs that we were looking for. Um, sometimes we just came up with better ideas once we were looking at something and we would go back and, and sort of replan and rewrite the specification. So I would say that there was quite a bit of looping between the planning and designing building phases. Um, today we are in the pilot phase. So what we're doing is administering these four tests out in, in the field to a wide range of examinees, uh, children through adults. Um, we're capturing all sorts of data. Um, the platform, the digital platform captures things like um, not only the score for, for each item, but what the examinee actually said to the item. So what was their response? Um, it captures data about timing. So we know how long it takes examinees to respond to different items. We also know how long it took to administer the test as a whole. So that's really useful information when we're thinking about planning for the future. Um, and finally, the other thing that we're doing in the field is we are um, capturing the audio recordings of all of the sessions. So we are able to go back and listen to everything that was said during the session between the examiner and the examinee. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little more later about how we're using some of that information. Um, but that's a, a platform feature that we decided to build in that has proved to be very very informational and very helpful um, throughout the uh, the development process and i think it's also going to be something that's going to be really helpful and useful to examiners in the field and so once this pilot phase is over we're going to be taking all of that data and and analyzing it um, looking at the item and test characteristics um, reviewing all of the qualitative data that we're getting um, we're we're asking examiners to tell us do you have problems with did you have problems with Wi-Fi? Did you have problems with the platform? Did something seem confusing? Um, was the examinee confused by anything? So we have ways to capture all of that information in the field and we're gonna be looking all that information over and really using it to help inform uh, the final product. Um, and then the final thing that we're gonna do during the evaluate phase is to assess the equivalency of the paper pencil version and the digital version. So this is um, something that I'm gonna talk about quite a bit today, but the general idea is that uh, this test will be released to, to customers with the WJ4 paper norms. And so the idea is that in order to support the equivalency of those scores, we really have to have data and evidence to show that, that the digital and paper pencil versions are really measuring the same things. So uh, that old that old saying, it takes a village, right? It takes a, a really, really talented and knowledgeable team um, internally to be able to put together um, a digital platform like this team has done in the last couple of years. So um, Riverside is very fortunate to have a lot of really talented people in house. Um, we have product managers who are very in tune to the market and understand what the customers need and, and also really understand what else is out there and you know how to, how to make this product um, viable and, and competitive um, with the market. Uh, we have a team of content developers who, um, many of whom are former school psychologists and, and educators, and uh, many of whom have firsthand experience using the WJ in their own practice. So um, that's really helpful when it comes to making decisions about content and adapting content to have people who have used the test in the field and who really understand, you know, what are the pain points and what are the, what are the things that we love about the test and what are things that we might change if we had the opportunity. Um, we have a team that we worked with, uh, a whole team of UI UX designers. And um, I like to think of these people as kind of the artists of the group. Um, they're the ones who, you know, take the, the, the prototypes and really make them look very pretty and add the color. And I think the, the thing that I learned the most working with these people is just how, in, how talented they are at understanding the way that people interact with technology and understanding how um, how to make a platform that's really intuitive to the user so that it doesn't require a whole lot of training or explanation. It's just you, you get to the platform and if you have administered the test before, um, I think you're going to find it really intuitive because of the work that this team did. 
Um, and then we have a team of software engineers or, or web developers who have to take all of the requirements and all of the content and all of the designs and really just synthesize everything and, and write the code to build the platform. Um, so this group of people um, has worked really hard and has somehow um, managed to to withstand all of our change change requests and and back and forth with designs um, but they've they've done a great job and I'm excited to show you the finished product a little later in this presentation um, finally internally there are a team of psychometricians who work in the research group and these are the people who are constantly challenging the team to be thinking about how changes how, how changing from a paper to a digital delivery system impacts the behavior of the examinee and therefore the potential for interpretations of those scores. So um, this is the team of people that's constantly saying, you know, we need to think about this and we need to think about that when it comes to the digital design, when it comes to instructions, um, when it, even when it comes to things like, you know, data capture and data export. So um, this team has really kept us on our toes and, and kept us thinking throughout the process. And I think um, because of that, I think I feel much more confident that our um, that are that we are going to be able to establish equivalency between the paper pencil and the digital versions. Um, and then finally, Riverside's really lucky to have a group of very dedicated customers who have donated their time and a lot of um, you know a lot of time in, in reviewing the the platform for us and giving us some really nice feedback along the way about you know things that they liked, things that they really wish the platform included. Um, and so we're really appreciative of of their input along the way as well. So at the beginning of our planning, um, the very first thing we, we needed to do as a team was to just come up with some high level goals for the project, right? So these are not things that are necessarily specific to individual features, but rather what are kind of some of the general goals that we have for the project? Um, and the, during the course of that, that process, we kind of were guided by three separate sets of guidelines or standards, if you will. Um, the first of those is the standards for educational and psychological assessment, which is um, a, a set of standards that really governs how test developers do their work and um, it talks about things like reliability and validity and fairness and bias and testing. Um, so those are standards that we're accustomed to, to following in, in the regular course of our paper pencil test development. Um, there's another set of guidelines that uh, was developed specifically to, um, to inform digital test delivery, and those are the guidelines for technology-based assessment. Um, those are published by ITC and, and the American, uh, the, sorry, the Association for Test Publishers. And those guidelines really speak specifically to test material that's delivered digitally. So um, they just get a little more specific than the standards do about um, the things you need to think about when you're delivering test content from a digital platform. And then finally, um, there was this other set of standards called the WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and these are really standards that govern the, the developers and, and the designers. And, and they talk about things like um, accessibility to you know, using certain fonts and certain colors um, and certain sizes of things on screen. So um, those are really the kind of the best practices for web design. So within the kind of the, the guidance of these three documents, the team came up with some really high level goals and you know among those uh, as I mentioned we want to maintain the test psychometric characteristics because we would like to um, assess the equivalency of the paper pencil and digital we want um, you know a really important goal is just we want to make the test easier to administer we want this to we want the platform to take on a lot of the work that the examiner um, has traditionally had to do in the paper pencil format and we want the platform to take on some of that work so that the examiner can be freed up to really focus more of their attention on the examinee and the examinee's behaviors and characteristics um, we also are hoping that by freeing the examinee or the examiner from some of those the more clerical tasks associated with uh, with assessment that it will help to reduce scoring errors and administration errors um, and just be more engaging in general. Um, in addition to the high level goals, we also needed, you know, we felt like we needed to kind of state some constraints, right? Some things that we wanted to make sure to avoid. Um, so we don't want to alter the test's intended constructs. And that this is the, the thing that we refer to as construct validity, right? We want, we want to maintain um, what it is we're measuring with the tests and digital. We don't want to introduce some sort of variance that's not related to those constructs. 
um, we don't want to impact the difficulty of the items. So we don't want things to get systematically easier or more difficult because they're being presented in a digital format. Um, kind of along those lines, we, we don't want to change the examinee's behavior or performance. So anything that we can do in the digital to kind of preserve the way that the examinee interacts with, with the test um, is going to be a good thing so that we, we avoid trying to, you know, change the examinee's behavior unintentionally. Um, we also want to make sure that the tests are not inaccessible to people who have limited exposure to technology. Um, and I think that's the case with, you know, with what we've done with the iPad and, and delivering the stimulus material on the iPad to the examinee. Um, from the examinee's perspective, it really doesn't look that much different than the easel test page. Um, and so that was, you know, that was something that we felt really strongly about making sure that we we don't make this content inaccessible to somebody who's never used an iPad or never seen an iPad. Um, and we don't want to require a steep learning curve for administration, either for the examiner or the examinee. So in thinking about, you know, how to kind of achieve those goals and, and yet at the same time of, avoid making, you know, avoid some of the pitfalls that we that are listed in our constraints column. Um, it was really helpful for me to think about the, the ways that the people and the components of a test session interact right so in any in any test session with the wj we have three things we have the examiner we have the examinee and we have the test itself the test materials so in this case the test materials are are the digital platform and that encompasses everything about the content of the test as well as the interface um, the logic and the way the test flows the way that the test is connected to the internet and, and the performance of the server all of that is kind of you know consumed in this green in this green circle. Um, the examiner is obviously the one kind of driving the administration, reading the items, scoring the items, um, and then the ex examinee, of course, is uh, processing both visual and auditory stimulus and making some decisions and providing responses, both you know orally and by pointing or, or tapping in the case of the platform. Um, and so you have these three kind of individuals, and they interact in different ways. Um, so it was really helpful for me to think about, you know, where are the potential sources of, of variance or potential sources of changing things when we go from paper to digital? Um, and how important are those are those changes? You know, if we, if we change something, is it something that's okay to change or is it something that we potentially might be breaking by changing it? Um, and so this was kind of the way that, you know, in my own mind, I was thinking through um, how we, you know, the kinds of changes that we want to think about and whether or not they're going to be potential sources of variance. So I do believe that the digital platform is a quite different experience for the examiner, right? So the way that the examiner is going to be interacting with the platform is very different from the way the examiner interacts with the test book or the easel, right? Instead of flipping pages, you're now going to be clicking to turn the page or to advance the screen. Um, a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the administrative clerical work is now going to be performed by the platform. These were things that the examiner formerly had to do, like um, make sure that they knew how many items were in the basil, make sure that they knew the correct starting item for the examinee. So all of these things are more automated in the digital platform. And so even though that is a really big difference for how the examiner interacts with the test, it's really transparent to the examinee, right? The examinee is not seeing any of that happening behind the scenes. So um, for that reason, I feel like there's probably going to be very little impact on examinee behavior due to those changes, right? And so that's kind of, you know, that top, that top intersection there between the orange and the green. Um, and then we have this interaction between the examiner and the examinee. And because we're preserving the, um, the way that the items are administered, either orally or, or visually, um, and the way that the examinee responds to those items, um, I really don't anticipate that that's gonna change a lot in the digital platform as well. So the examiner will still be reading items, for example, in oral vocabulary, and the examinee will still be answering orally. So, in terms of those two interact, you know, those two interacting, I don't see a lot of change, um, very minimal changes, and probably things that are not going to significantly impact the way that the examinee behaves. Um, 
But these other interactions are the things that I think we need to be more focused on, right? So how does the examinee interact with the platform? And those are places where we have a, a much greater potential for to introduce variants when we're going from paper to digital. Um, and then, of course, we have the interaction between all three of these things, which is, you know, something that's a little more complex and also something that we need to just be very aware of. So once we kind of thought about the different interactions and you know the potential sources for change, um, we kind of went through and decided to to figure out what those potential sources are and then how to mitigate them you know how to how to plan for those things in the course of our product development so that we can mitigate for them along the way and instead of having to come back later and try to figure out solutions for problems um, so as i said earlier one of the things that we we think could be a potential threat to equivalency is um, item difficulty changes so the question is you know are we going to change the difficulty of an item or a set of items when we go from presenting them in paper to presenting them in um, in a digital format. And so the way that we mitigated that in our development plan was to try as much as possible to maintain the same stimulus format. So if it was a if it was an orally administered item before, it's still orally administered. If it was something that the examinee had to look at on the test book, now they look at it on the iPad. So we really tried to maintain all of that um, that consistency so that uh, the examinee really doesn't have a different experience in interacting with the items. Um, another potential threat to equivalency or a potential source of score change is if we were to introduce some unintended interactions. So, for example, if the examinee um, was taking the test and the examiner suddenly was pausing a lot and maybe, you know, clicking around and um, not quite sure what they were doing, maybe a little bit confused by the, by the interface, um, that could potentially negatively impact the examinee's experience, right? So um, the goal there is to make sure that the, the platform is as streamlined as possible and that the administrator, administration workflow um, flows very naturally and that it's very intuitive to the examiner. Um, and by doing that, we avoid you know, having a steep learning curve and having examiners who have to really think hard while they're giving this test, right? We want them to be able to enter the platform and to just um, really focus their attention on their examinee and not having to be struggle, struggling with the platform interface. So again, that was something that we kind of planned for and, and really thought about as we were, um, as we were designing the platform. Um, and then another threat to potential a threat to equivalency is um, just disruptions that might happen because this is now a browser based product. So it's it's dependent on being connected to Wi Fi. And um, as we all know, if you're if you're on a zoom call and you suddenly see the little, you know, the little circle starts start spinning, you know that that means Oh, okay, maybe my internet's going to go out, or maybe my internet is, is not very strong right now, or I have a bandwidth issue. Um, and so you know, that's, there's a potential for bandwidth issues anytime you're doing a browser-based product. Um, and so I think, you know, the team, the software engineering team has done an amazing job of um, really addressing that from the get-go. Um, so they've done a lot of work on sort of experimenting with how robust can the platform be to minor blips in internet connectivity. And these are things that happen for everybody all the time. Um, and what we found is that it actually is quite robust, right? So there, you know, the, the platform can really withstand, um, uh, you know, some degree of, of minor Wi-Fi blips. It stays connected. The examinee's iPad stays connected. Um, and then, of course, we've we've decided to add some um, some monitoring metrics to the platform as well. So examiners are able to tell, you know, how strong their connection is their connection is. So um, these are just like three examples of different kinds of threats to the equivalent uh, the equivalency of the paper, pencil, and digital. Um, things that, you know, happen as a result of, of people interacting with each other or with the platform. Um, it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to give you some examples of some of the things that we had to think about as we were going through and designing, um, designing the platform. So at that point, we really kind of shifted into the design build phase. Um, and this is where the fun starts, right? This is where you get to actually start thinking about, OK, what do we want it to look like? And what do we want it to do? And what do we want the buttons to, to do? And you know, where do the buttons need to be? And um, so 
we had a lot of design decisions that had to be made. And um, so again, I'm kind of classifying these, these are very high level design decisions and they're certainly not exhaustive, but um, it's just some examples of some of the decisions that we had to make along the way. Um, and also kind of some of the ways that we were thinking about how those decisions would impact those interactions that were happening during the testing session. So um, in the first panel here, we have some design decisions that are really specific to how the examiner interacts with the platform. So as I've said, we really made an effort to make the user interface um, intuitive. Um, we decided that we would audio record all the test sessions for later examiner review. And that, that feature really started out to be something that we thought would be beneficial to the examiner. And we found it to be extremely beneficial for our own work and development. So that sort of was like a, an unexpected surprise. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, too, we, we really wanted the platform to automate a lot of the administration tasks that are currently happening in paper pencil. So um, the platform will select the starting point. It will determine the item order. It will monitor the basal and ceiling rules and the cutoff rules. Um, in a lot of cases, the platform will automatically score the item once the examiner has selected the response that the examinee gave. Um, and it also provides you triggers for giving feedback if an examinee gets an item a uh, sample item incorrect the platform will automatically trigger the the script of what you're supposed to say to them so um i'll show i'll show you some of that later um, when i show some platform screenshots but um just to kind of give you a high level idea of the things that are going to be taken off the examiner's plate by the platform the second panel here are things that um, design decisions that we made that really i think impact the way that the examinee is going to in, uh, interact with with the platform um, and again this is one of those areas that and i have it in orange here because it's one of those areas that we we need to be kind of careful right we need to make sure that we're not doing things that are going to change the examinee's behavior um, and so some of the high level decisions that were made um, one is to retain the the paper pencil stimuli presentation and item response modes as much as possible. Um, so one of the things that we did change that I'm going to mention here and I'll show later is that um, we decided to go with what's called a sans serif font for the examinee stimuli. Um, and that was really based on some early input in some of those WCAG compliance um, kinds of issues that I talked about earlier um, with accessibility. So the WCAG guidelines suggest that a sans serif font, and a sans serif font is, is one that's similar to the font I've used on these screens here. Um, it's one that doesn't have the little sort of ornate little corners that come off of the, each of the letters. Um, and the sans serif font is just a better, is just a better one to use for um, accessibility on web design. So for people, it's just more accessible to people, a wide range of people, um, those with disabilities and those perhaps with low vision, um, sometimes even people with certain types of reading disabilities are just better able to process sans serif font. So um, that was a design decision that was made that kind of took us a little bit away from the paper pencil version where we use a serif font for the examinee stimuli. Um, but I think that uh, the font that was chosen, we spent a lot of time thinking about it and reviewing different fonts. Um, and I think the font that was chosen is, is really nice. It's um, childlike enough that, that young children are gonna be able to interpret and understand the words, the letters, but it's also not so childlike that it's inappropriate for older children and adults. So um, I'll show you that in a little bit. But that's one place where we did, you know, sort of diverge a little bit from the, the paper pencil. But I think, again, it's it was a necessary change and something that really, you know, is is more appropriate for the digital administration. Um, another change that we made from paper to digital and another design decision um, was to present only one word or one one item per, per page or screen. Um, and so a lot of you probably are, you know, know that in the WJ currently we have multiple items per page for many tests um, and that's really just a constraint that's that exists in paper pencil testing because if we were to print you know one item per page you would now have like 25 easel books instead of you know the the, the handful that you have so um really that was a necessary constraint in that in that environment but in the digital environment that constraint does not exist right so 
it doesn't cost us any more money and it doesn't make the platform any heavier to to have one item per page and so the design decision was made to to do that to do one item per page um and i think the really nice advantage of that is that well two things one is that the examinee doesn't need to be distracted or confused by having multiple items on the page. Um, and the other is that we, now, we no longer need to enforce a test by complete page rule um, because really that test by complete page rule existed because there were multiple items on the page. Um, so without, you know, without that, we, we can get rid of that rule and I think it's, it's gonna make the testing more efficient and, and in some ways a little less painful for examiner and examine, examinee alike. Um, Another design decision that was made was to maintain the portrait mode for the iPad. So the examinee will always be looking at the iPad in portrait mode. They won't turn it on its side. Um, and again, that was just a decision that was made to keep things more streamlined and to make things less confusing for the examiner and the examinee. Um, and then finally, in this category, um, another big important one is that we decided that regardless of the size of the examinee's iPad screen, that the visual stimulus would always be the same size. So it's not the case that people who are using a bigger iPad will see bigger words. Everything's gonna remain the same. Um, and that was a little bit of a challenge because our, our you know, of course the, the web designers, for them a standard is to have the, the content adapt to the screen size. But in this particular testing situation, um, that's not a desirable thing, right? We want everybody to see the stimulus in the same way. And so it, it made more sense for us to say, no, let's hold the stimulus size constant and let the screen size adapt to that. So. Again, just a design just decision that was made based on some of those, you know, thinking about some of the goals and constraints of the product. Um, we don't really expect that, you know, that any of our design decisions are going to have an impact on the examiner examinee um, interaction so much. Um, but we do anticipate that there will be some, you know, potential interactions or, or potential changes to interactions between sort of the three players. Um, and these are where some of our design decisions came in about the browser-based platform, right? So if the if the browser, if the platform is based in a browser, it's automatically saving all the time. We don't have to worry about auto say, you know, the examiner going in there and saving their scores and saving the responses. It's auto saving. So if there is a disconnection, um, nothing needs to be redone and nothing is lost. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we have a connection strength uh, test and we monitor the signal strength throughout the test session. Um, and we also included a brief tutorial to introduce the test session, the iPad, and some of the icons that the examinee is gonna be seeing. And this is really just a way to ensure that people who haven't had a lot of exposure to an iPad or to digital technology um, are not entering the test for the first time, never having held an iPad in their hands. So we're giving them an opportunity to, to hold it and to feel it and touch it and sort of do some stuff on it before the test session begins. Um, and then last but not least, we um, have made the decision, the design decision to automate some of the more complex item task introductions. Um, so in this one, I'm speaking specifically to some of the introductions in the concept formation test. And I have a little video that I want to play you later, but I don't know if the sound is going to work. So um, you'll, you might get a chance to see that. You might not. Depends if my technology cooperates with me here. Um, so now the fun part, right? So we. Um, built and designed this digital, this digital platform. And I'm just gonna give you, like I said, a really brief kind of tutorial or introduction to the platform. Um, Katie's gonna give you a much more in-depth look in her hour, I believe. So um, I'm just gonna be kind of touching on some of the highlights. Don't worry if I don't cover all of the little icons that you see here. Um, so on the left-hand side of the page, we have um, what we call the examiner's interface. And this is where the examiner does most of their work, right? So they are reading the item script. You can see we have the item script up here. And you'll notice that the words that are spoken are still in blue bold, but you can see that they're kind of a darker greenish blue now. They're not such a bright blue. Um, and there's actually a reason for that. And that is that our designers told us very early on that in a web environment, people see blue and they think they should click on it because it's a link. And so the blue that we had in our printed textbooks, in our printed test books that told the examiner when to say the words out loud, actually could be misinterpreted in a digital platform as being a link to something. And so um, this is again, one of those design decisions that's really driven by, um, by usability and, and intuition. And so the decision was made to just kind of change that script a little bit. So it's a little bit of more of a blue green, um, but you will notice down below that we still have 
these words in blue, right? And that's because these are actually links. These are things that are clickable, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so this is the, examinee's inter the examiner's interface. You can see we've got the item text, we've got the scoring keys, and then we've got some other stuff going on down here that I'll talk about in a minute. And over here on the right-hand side is what we call the examinee's view. And it's called the examinee's view because that's what the examinee sees. Um, so this is basically just a screenshot or a preview of what the examinee is seeing on their iPad. Um, and you can hide this panel or show it. So you can, you know, if you need more space, you can get rid of it. Um, but this would be analogous to like in a testing, in a paper testing situation to like leaning over and looking around the side of your easel to see what's on their side or to standing up and looking over the top of the easel to see what the examinee is looking at. Um, well, now in the digital interface, you don't need to do that anymore. You are now able to see exactly what the examinee is looking at on your own screen. Um, and it's also the case that you can take control of this examinee's view and use a pointer tool to point to things. And, and that's built in, you know, native to some of the tests. Um, and that's a really nice feature because it doesn't require you to reach over and actually point to something on, on the examinee's iPad itself. You can just point to it using your examinee's view and they're gonna see the pointer show up on their iPad, um, which I think is kind of cool. Um, and this is also, um, I wanted to show you an example of, of what the typeface is that we decided on. I mentioned earlier about um, changing the typeface to a sans serif font. And um, this is Andica, which is our sans serif stimuli font. Um, and you'll have a couple more opportunities to see other words here in a second. So the scoring keys, just like on the paper version, the scoring keys are providing you with the most common correct and incorrect responses. Um, and so as you click on one of those words, you, you hear the examinee's response, you find it in the scoring key, you click on it, and it will highlight and the autom the automatically the item will be scored. So it will either be scored correct or incorrect based on what you chose. <clears throat> we also have this other down here, and this is for situations which happen a lot in certain tests where um, an examinee gives a response, but it's not one of the responses in the scoring key. And sometimes those, sometimes those responses are actually correct, and sometimes they're not correct. And sometimes the examiner doesn't really know if it's correct or incorrect, and they will want to write it down and you know look it up later and kind of maybe talk to a colleague and decide if they should give credit for that response or not. Um, so the interesting thing about this feature is that the way that we originally designed it, we had a little free text field there next to the word other. And so we had told the examinees to go in if the examinees, uh, if the examinee says something that's not in the key, we told the examiners to go in there and just type the word and then score it. Um, and this is one of those interesting things where we started listening to the voice captures of some of our sessions and you can see up here. I've showed you here the circled this. This means this little red icon means that the, the voice is being captured as you're testing. So we went in and we started to review those voice captures. And we started to notice that every time an examiner would start to type, examinees would change their answer. They would, they would somehow they were cued that, oh, maybe if they're typing the word, it's not the right answer. And I better come up with a different answer. And so we noticed fairly early on that this, this feature, this particular design feature that we had incorporated was really having a negative impact on the, the interaction between the examiner, the examinee and the platform, right? So the examinee's behavior was changing based on something that the platform was doing or something that the platform was requiring. And so um, that was one of those examples of, of an unintended consequence of, of making the change to digital um, that, you know, has the potential to impact examining behavior. So the way that we solve for this is we just took away that free, that free text field. And now we're giving examiners the ability to just flag the item. So if they have a, a word that's presented and they don't know how to score it, they just take their best guess. They can go down here and click this little flag icon. And then at the end of the test, the platform will bring them back to that item and they can play the recording and hear what the examinee said and then think more, you know, have more time to think about how to score it. Um, so just again, like some of the some of the lessons that we've learned and some of the ways that we've had to kind of go back and, and rethink things um, as we've gone through the this whole development process. Um, so you can see on this item when the examiner chose the response small that the feedback automatically appeared up 
the, the feedback for the item actually replaced the item text up on the top of the page. So um, this is analogous to those little error no response boxes that used to appear on the paper test book on the far right hand column. So in paper, you had to remember that if the examinee made a mistake on a sample item, you had to look over to that to that pink box and then say whatever the pink box said. Um, well, in the digital platform, as soon as you select an incorrect response on a sample item, that item card at the top of the page is going to change. And so you'll automatically know that, oh, this is something I need to act on because it changed, right? And so that's just, again, adding some of that automaticity into the platform um, to take some of, the, some of the decisions off of the examiner. And you can see down here by this next button, this is the way that you advance the screen to the, to the next item. Um, and we have a little indicator that tells you what is the next item. So in this case, because the examinee answered this item incorrectly, they would automatically get the second trial of sample item A. And so it tells you there that if when you click that blue arrow button, it's gonna bring you to sample A trial two. Now, if I were to instead collect click on a correct response here, it would bring me to a different item, right? It would skip over trial two and bring me to the next the next item in, in the workflow. So um, that's just a nice little feature that examiners can use to kind of keep track of, you know, what's coming next or where are we going next in this test? And so speaking of where do we go next, right? So the platform is really gonna be driving the, um, the order of administration. And one of the things I talked earlier about how, how we had to, as a team, kind of think about how we do things differently in digital. Um, and this is one of those things where we really spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do we communicate, how does the development team communicate to the software engineers how to program the logic of these tests, right? So how do, how do we tell it where to start and how do we tell it how to go forward or backward to get a basal or ceiling? How do we tell it to evaluate you know, item scores at various points to, um, to compute raw scores and decide if we need to keep going or if the test should end? Um, and so we came up with this idea of a logic map, which is essentially just a flowchart. Um, but we came up with um, one of these logic maps for each of the tests. And so when we would turn over all of the content and all of the design specifications um, to the engineering team to build, we'd also give them a map like this. And this is what helped them to kind of figure out how to, how to program the test so that it flows just as it would in the same order that it would if you were giving the test in paper. Uh, this is actually the logic map for concept formation in case anybody didn't, uh, wasn't able to notice that intuitively. Um, something else that kind of resulted out of the work with the, the, the platform automating the, the workflow, and that is that um, for some of us that might feel kind of uncomfortable, right? Because when you're giving the test in paper pencil, you always know where you are. You can always look ahead and see where you're going. Um, you can look back and see where you've been. You have this test record where you're documenting the, the item scores. So you can just look up the column and you can say, okay, I know the examinee got a basal. Um, I know that they've, you know, they, they've gotten four items in a row wrong and I only need two more to get a ceiling or something like that. So you're just, you have a lot more control over the navigation in paper. And that was something that we thought might be a little uncomfortable for examiners. Um, and so we wanted to come up with a way for examiners to really kind of have an analogy to that test record in, in the digital platform. And so what we came up with was kind of this bottom navigation down here. Um, and you see that it really kind of matches up with the way that things look on this column. So you can see each of these cards represents an item in this test. And the little check marks just mean that the examinee got the item right, and the little X means that they got the item wrong. And you can see which items have been administered and which ones have not yet been administered. Um, the item that you're on is the one that has the little circle around it, around the little check mark. Um, and basically, it just kind of lets you know like where you've been and where you're going. Um, how many more items do I need to, to get a ceiling, right? So I can just look at these cards and kind of count out. Um, we also have a little raw score indicator over here, and this is sort of the analogy to the sum at the bottom of the column over here. Um, and this raw score will be updating as you give items. So um, as soon as the examinee has a, a basal, that raw score will compute and it will continue to compute until the test ends at the ceiling. And when that happens, when the examinee reaches a ceiling, the platform is going to tell you the test is ending because the examinee has reached a ceiling. Um, so this is just really nice. You, you know, again, you don't have to keep counting and keep track of, of whether you have a ceiling and you have to keep going. The platform is just going to do that for you. Um, 
And then we, one of the things that we added, um, I think just as a nice feature for examiners, um, very doesn't impact the administration at all, but could potentially down the road impact the, the usability of the information from the assessment. Um, and that is that we added some qualitative observations to each of the tests. So in the paper version, you're used to seeing those qualitative observations in some of the achievement standard tests. Um, but we've decided that those are useful things to include in all of the tests. So at the end of each test, you'll have the opportunity to go in and to select um, some behaviors or some um, some kind of qualitative observations. And if you choose not to select any, you can just say none of the above and you'll have the opportunity to move on at that point. And at that point, if you decide that you want to begin the next test, which in this case, in this case was concept formation, um, you are automatically directed to the suggested starting point for your examinee's age or grade. So um, in the prior test, you know, in the paper test, you had to look in that little pink table at the beginning of the test to see which page you should turn to and which item you should start with. Um, the platform is now going to do that for you, um, but it's also going to allow you to override that. So if you're testing um, an examinee that you know is, is particularly low or, or high ability for their age or grade, um, you can override that start point and, and start really at, at any of the starting points. So this is um, this is a thing that I was really excited to show you. I don't think that the the audio is going to work, but I'm going to give it just a, a quick try. Um, and this is one of those things where I talked about earlier, where um, we introduced a design feature that we think could potentially change the interaction between the examiner and the examinee in the platform, but probably for the better. We believe that this is a change that could actually help standardize the administration and make things more. Um, understandable to the examinee. Um, and so most of you who have given concept formation, um, I'm sure are aware of some of the painful introductions that you have to read. So while you're reading the introduction to the, to the task and you're trying to teach the examinee sort of how to do this task, um, you're having to reach around and point to things on the examinee's page and all the while file, follow the script and be pointing to the right thing at the right time. So um, as anybody who's ever given this test knows, it's a very hard thing to do and to do it well. Um, and so we thought, you know, this is a way that we could take the digital technology that we have available to us and really use it to the advantage of the examiner. Um, and so we had created these little introduction modules and they're just um, little animations with um, voice that goes with. And essentially what it does is it takes the script and the pointing from the paper version, which I'm showing you here, and incorporates it into just a little um, into a little video. So I'm going to just play here if I can. Oops, well, sorry, lost that. Um, let me see if I can just play this if it's going to let me. Nope, it's not going to let me play. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I know you probably can't hear this, but I'm just wanting you to envision. Um, saying the script along with this this video as it's animated, the directions that you would normally read are actually being being spoken by the voiceover of the animation. So this is saying there's a drawing inside the box and a drawing outside the box. So anyway, um, sorry that I can't show the, the video with the animation but or with the voiceover, but um, it's really neat. I think that it's gonna make the um, administration of the controlled learning tests like concept formation so much easier on the part of the examiner. So in just a few minutes that we have left, I wanna just quickly kind of talk about um, our next steps. So as I said earlier, we're out there in the field gathering data um, and we're gathering a lot of data, a lot of different kinds of data. And so the next step will be to just evaluate um, things like the actual quantitative data. So, you know, how difficult are the items in digital versus in paper pencil and are they equivalents in, in the two modes? Um, we're gonna look at, we have ways of looking at our data file and, and being able to see if a disconnect happened, if a, any sort of Wi-Fi disconnect happened during that test. Um, and so we can try to quantify, you know, is there impact on examinee's performance if there is a, a, a web or a, a browser disconnection? Um, as I said earlier, we're going to be continuing to review voice recordings and to look at some of the qualitative information that we get from those. Um, and then finally, we will be um, 
looking at the test, sub test session observation data. And this is where we're asking examiners to just answer some questions at the end of the testing session um, to let us know how things went and, and whether you know, there are any suggestions that they have for um, how to improve their experience. So, um, so all of that data will be really synthesized and, um, and analyzed and um, with the eventual goal of releasing this, this digital cognitive battery to, um, to the customer base with some, as I said earlier, some um, evidence to support the comparability of the scores from paper, pencil, from paper pencil to digital. So that's really all that I had today. It looks like my timing is just about right. Um, probably not a lot of time for questions, but I'm happy if, Sarah, if you have any to, to answer those. Otherwise, um, please feel free to reach out by email or by LinkedIn. I'd be really super happy to engage in, in conversation about anything that I've talked about today. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you so much for the excellent information. Um, we do have a couple of minutes. We can do a couple of questions. Um, if you submitted a question that doesn't get addressed, um, rest assured that I will get some follow-up information from Dr. LaFour and put out a short FAQ for those um, questions that we're not able to get to. Uh, I'm just gonna sort of go down the line. Um, the first question is, can it be administered from different environments? For example, an examiner in one location and a student in another location, or does the student have to have, have to be right by the examiner? That's a great question. Um, so currently today, um, it needs to be administered face-to-face, -face. Um, but it has been designed with an eye toward a remote administration down the road. So it's definitely not something that we're ready for today, but um, certainly it's, it's, it's been in the back of everybody's minds throughout the de design and development process. Okay. Any plan to offer the WJ4 COG subtest individually? For example, it'd be nice if I could just administer the processing speed subtest to a client without throwing away the rest of the protocol. Yeah, I'm not sure if that question is um, specifically in regard to the digital or it sounds like it may be a paper pencil question because of the um, re reference to the protocol, but um, that I actually am probably can't speak to. Um, that would probably be more of a Katie question. Katie's gonna be our next presenter. So I don't know if you wanna hold that one for her. That might be a good one for her to answer. Sure, we'll put that in our back pocket. I'm assuming they're thinking of a protocol as a sort of a entire digital test record, but we'll get some uh, clarification sure, from yeah, yeah. Dr. Okay. Jensky um, coming up next. Um, will we be able to do computer browser to computer browser or only the examinee can be on the computer browser and the exam examiner can be on the computer browser and the examinee has to be on an iPad? Sure, that's a great question too. So um, it is technologically possible to open the examinee's um, experience on a browser. Um, however, it's not recommended. It's not how we have designed it and it's not how we are gathering the data on it. So I would say, you know, the, the company stance is probably on that going to be that it needs to be administered, um, you know, operationally on a browser and an iPad. Um, and again, some of that has to do with sizing. The, the simulae have all been designed to be, you know, appropriately sized on an iPad. So. Perfect. Um, I guess the last question will kind of combine a couple into one. Some questions about observations. I know you looked, um, showed us the qualitative sort of checklists that are going to be available, but there have been a couple questions about observations. And will there be an opportunity or place for examiners to make notes in the platform or any kind of other um, ways to sort of facilitate some of those behavioral observations that they make throughout the testing session? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And I, I'm guessing that Katie will cover this in her presentation um, next hour. But yes, there are um, lots of opportunities to take notes throughout the administration. So we have notes that um, can be taken about specific items. So you can take a note at an item level. Um, you can also insert a note at the test level and you can insert a note or, or set of notes at the session level. So um, lots of different places. And then the idea is that, you know, down the road, those notes will be available to you as an examiner to go back and look at later um, post-testing session. Yep, that's a great question. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for the information. It was an excellent session. I'm glad um, you were able to join us today. Um, we are super excited to get started with our second session. If you will just give us a brief moment to get everything situated for our next speaker. <laughs>